عمل إرهابي لا يمكن السقوط عنه وسترد كيد الكائدين وشماتة الشامتين مجموعة قليلة مريضة الآن سقطت الأقنعة عن وجوه هذه الأطراف حزني وألم كبيران إلى مواجهات مؤسفة الشبان ليس لهم ذنب أبدا هم صغار سن أدمت قلبي كما أدمت قلب كل سوري لا رئاسة بدى الحياة المحققة للانتقال السلمي للسلطة أنا لو عندي منصب لو عندي لوني رئيس لو كنت لوحت الاستقالة على وجوهكم فأنا أكون في هذا الموقع بدعم من الشعب وعندما أترك هذا الموقع يكون أيضا برغبة من هذا الشعب أفندم أنا موجود أنا سأذهب إلى أمريكا مشاهدو العربية أهلا وسهلا بكم إلى هذه الحلقة النقاشية التي نأتيكم بها من المنتدى الاقتصادي العالمي من دافوس ونناقش فيها واقع ومستقبل العالم العربي بعد عام على الثورات التي صنعت تاريخا جديدا لمنطقة الشرق الأوسط لغة اللغة الرسمية بالمنتدى الاقتصادي العالمي هي الإنجليزية وبالتالي سيكون نقاشنا اليوم بالإنجليزية Ladies and gentlemen العربية would like to welcome you to this panel which discusses the implications of the Arab Spring which is shaping a new future for the Middle East, a future that has risks and opportunities on the economic, political and social fronts. To discuss this topic, we have with us today our panelists. Dr. Robert Hormatz is the U.S. Under Secretary of State for Economic, Energy and Agricultural Affairs. Also with us is Mr. Ali Babajan, who is the Deputy Prime Minister for Economic and Financial Affairs of Turkey. Mr. Mohamed Boulif is the Minister of Governance and General Affairs of Morocco. Also with us is Dr. Mustafa Nabli, who is the Governor of the Central Bank of Tunisia, and Mr. Ibrahim Dabdou, who is the group CEO of the National Bank of Kuwait. You will all be uh, having the chance later on to, the, to address your questions to our panelists. But first of all, I would like to start with a question to Mr. Ali Babajan because we have seen an increasingly important role for Turkey in the Middle East in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. The question is, there have, there have been so many setbacks so far. If we were to look a little bit forward, what is it that makes you worried about the events and what gives you optimism? Well, uh, our region, uh, North Africa and Middle East, is going through a historical transition process. This process, in our view, is long overdue. It was something already expected. Maybe we could not guess the exact time of this transition to start. But this is now already an irreversible process and also an inevitable process. It is quite homegrown, so it was actually uh, happening in a very natural way. So there, there are no, no foreign forces or other... No foreign uh, other, intervention? No foreign intervention. So it, it was quite homegrown, and it happened by the domestic social dynamics of many countries. But of course, the pressure was already there. Expectations were already increasing. People were already asking for more, for better. And the regimes, sooner or later, had to take into account the aspiration and the will of their citizens. And what's happening right now is there is a huge social interaction going on, not only within every country, but across the Arab world. Because there are uh, many, many countries where people s speak the same language, and every single individual is right now like a small broadcasting station. They just tweet a few words, few sentences and hundreds of thousands of young people read it at the same time. So there's huge interaction going on. A very small satellite dish is enough to receive hundreds of TV channels. So it was no longer possible to continue with a closed, with a closed regime suppressing the people in a way where population is already becoming an inevitably open population, open society. But Mr. Babadon, it hasn't been smooth. We have seen a lot of setbacks. And this is why I ask you, if we were to look forward, uh, what are the things that make you worry as Turkey? First of all, I think it is going to be very important not to use any kind of force or aggression against the people themselves. And it's very important for this transition to happen in an orderly way. 
it was very important for the leaders to lead the change themselves rather than being pushed for change. And it is right now a time where there are challenges, you are right, but on the other hand, there are also huge opportunities. And when and if this transition happens and uh, finishes uh, in a healthy way, this is going to provide an enormous opportunity for the whole region. Because the region has a huge potential. Natural resources, young population, and also a huge possibility to do trade and investments intra-region and with other parts of the world. We will be discussing the economic aspect, but I'd like to hear also from Dr. Bob Hormatz um, as well. Um, what is it that makes you worry going forward? Well, I think that almost by definition, these uh, changes are not going to be smooth. And in virtually no period where you have had revolutionary change has it been a straight line from a revolution to a smoothly running democracy. In the United States, those of you familiar with, the, with American history, we had what was known as the Articles of Confederation after 1776. They were a complete failure. And after ye several years of failure, they had to rewrite the Constitution in, in 1783. So uh, we can't expect this to be a smooth process. But I think the key point is that the people of the region who are engaged in this process, they're demonstrating their desire for dignity, for opportunity, uh, for their governments to listen to their aspirations about political participation and economic participation. So I think, by and large, it is a very healthy process of the people speaking for themselves. As Ali says, it's a, it's a homegrown process. It's not one that is uh, caused by outsiders. Outsiders should not interfere with it, let the people of the region express themselves. But interference and, happened in Libya. And go through the process. Well, that, was, that wasn't in, in, the, in the revolution. That was because the government was suppressing the people and a, a lot of countries decided that there were lots of lives at stake. But now as the, as the process, the democratic process unfolds, there's not interference. It was only because of the violence perpetrated by the government against the people that uh, there was foreign pressure there was and foreign involvement. But as the democratic process evolves, people will make mistakes. They need the opportunity to make mistakes. They will learn from those mistakes. And I think that the, the general notion of a democratic reform process, a more market-oriented reform process, where people have a chance to participate in forming their government, are they going to do it perfectly? Is it going to be smooth? Probably not. But in no revolution I'm aware of has it been smooth. Let the people do what the democratic process is, is now enabling them to do, which is to express themselves. They've had elections in two countries. There are political changes in other countries of the region. Uh, Libya will have to work itself out. It's, it's a little more complicated. But this is a healthy process. We can't be impatient. We can't be overly involved. We have to support the, the political and That's economic it, change. You mentioned a lot of points that, that can be controversial, uh, especially, I mean, I didn't want to talk about Syria now. We will be going back to it. But since you mentioned um, foreign intervention, that it happened in Libya for a purpose because there was killing of the people, well, the same thing happened, is happening in Syria today. Syria and Libya are very different countries with very different situations. And I think just because... Uh, a number of countries, NATO countries, uh, were engaged in Libya doesn't mean uh, that they uh, can be effectively engaged or should be engaged in Syria. Each country is different. I think in Libya it worked out quite well. It gave the people of Libya an opportunity. Syria is a much more complicated, much different set of circumstances. I'm sure we have a lot to uh, say about that because, I mean, there are so many different opinions on what is happening in Syria. But let's continue with the, uh, the general evaluation of what has been happening so far uh, today with Mr. Mohamed Boulif. I'd like to uh, discuss a little bit Morocco because it was a different, different case, totally different case. In Morocco, it was preemptive. Uh, there was reform to the constitution. Yeah before basically uh, the uprising happened in the street. Uh, you were on the opposition side. Now you are represented in the government. Do you think that today the reform that has happened, is it sufficient to, uh, for the people of Morocco? Are they satisfied with that change or they need more? 
نعم أكيد أن ما حصل في المغرب يمكن أن يعتبر تجربة متميزة في إطار الاستثناء ما نسميه نحن بالاستثناء المغربي أكيد أن ما حصل كان يجب أن يحصل في مجموعة من الدول العربية وإن كان قد تأخر كثيرا المغرب ملك المغرب استطاع أن يلتقط الإشارات الأولى لحركة الشارع المغربي يوم 20 فبراير استطاع أن يلتقط أيضا الحركية والدينامية الشعبية في الدول المجاورة فصدر عنه خطاب في 9 مارس ثم جاء التعديل الدستوري يوم فاتح يوليوز ثم جاءت الانتخابات التي استطاع حزب العدالة والتنمية بين قوسين دي مرجعية إسلامية أن يحصل على المرتبة الأولى بأكثر من 30% من المقاعد وهو الآن يتركز يترأس الحكومة بحكم الدستور أكيد أن ما وصلنا إليه يصله الآخرون في مصر وفي تونس وفي ليبيا عبر ما حصل نحن نتصور أن الحراك في المغرب الحراك السلمي أولا الدافع إليه كان هو الحراك المجتمعي الشبابي الذي أضطر على اتخاذ مثل هذه القرارات من طرف الملك ثم إن هذا الحراك نظرا لما نتج عنه في الدول المجاورة نحن قرأنا ودرسنا ونظرنا إلى ما يحصل بجانبنا وارتأينا أن ننتقل بطريقة سلسة سلمية هل وصلنا إلى ما يجب أن يعني إلى مبتغى الشعب المغربي؟ أكيد أن الإصلاحات لا يمكن أن تأتي بمئة في المئة بجرعة واحدة هناك انتقاد, هناك انتقاد أن نفس الوجوه لا تزال هناك بعض نفس الوجوه موجودة بالحكومة يا سيدتي الإصلاح كما قلت لا يأتي مئة في المئة بالمرة واحدة الآن نحن مؤمنون أن في المغرب يجب أن تمر هذه الخمس سنوات سنوات انتقالية على أساس أن ننتقل ما هو إيجابي جداً وأن الدستور فيه جراعات إصلاحية وديمقراطية كبيرة وتتيح لرئيس الحكومة أن يسير الحكومة بطريقة تكاد تكون مئة في المئة دون تدخلات مباشرة أو غير مباشرة من خلال هذه الإصلاحات ومن خلال هذه التجربة الجديدة وبالدعم الشعبي وأقول بالدعم الشعبي آخر إجراء ميداني حصل منذ أكثر من 15 يوم يقول بأن حكومة العبد الإله بن كيران عندها 88% من التأييد الشعبي وتنتظر هي أمل هي أمل المغاربة كلهم فالمغاربة الآن يريدون أن يجربوا هذا الأمل ويتمنون أن الحكومة القادمة التي نحن جزء منها ستنجح في تحقيق ما, حق ما لم يحققه الآخر في الدول المجاورة نعقد الأمد على أنه بالفعل أننا سنأتي بالجديد وإلا, وإلا لا قدر الله سيكون مصير المغرب هو مصير الدول المجاورة هذا ما لا نتمناه لبلدنا هي المشكلة على كل عندما يكون في هاي ليفل اوف اكسبكتيشنز توقعات عالية على كل uh, سأنتقل إلى I'll move on now to دكتور مصطفى نابلي um, دكتور نابلي in Tunisia basically it was the smoothest transition that we witnessed uh, in the Arab world yet some still think that the political process is not going in the right direction uh, why is that? Listen, this is how I would, I would you know, compare where we were last year and now. I think one year ago, uh, when the revolution started and, and things, I think we were dreaming, and we were dreaming with our feet in the sky. I think now we are still dreaming, but we are dreaming with our feet in the ground. Uh, it's not so easy to do uh, these political transformations. It's very difficult and very tough. Uh, so we have had, relatively speaking, a smooth transition, a transformation polit at the political level, but we are still not there. Uh, I think somebody was asking what democracy is. Are elections a democracy? Uh, no. Elections are just one part of democracy. Democracy is a lot more. And why we still have some, you know, uh, way to go? Uh, I think all of specialists about transitions, democratic transition, emphasize the following, emphasize the need during the transitions to bring people together, to uh, emphasize what makes people live together, not what divides them. And that's where we are still not there yet, because I think what we have seen recently, more things that are about what divides people. We are seen at the social level, at the political level. At But there the is criticism here that the, the party that has won the elections, basically the, the Islamist party, uh, that there is a new face now for, for Tunisia. And this is why there is division about that. Because yes. Tunisia was very secular. It was uh, promoting the rights of women. They have the best rights in the Arab world, Tunisian women. So isn't that what is making or causing the division? Uh, I street. don't know whether it is, uh, I would say whether it's the party which is in government now or whether it is other parties, other parts of society which are trying to play that, that role. So we are seeing more divisions along those lines because of the 
uh, you know, uh, the role of women and the, uh, the private uh, freedoms, individual freedoms and, pri and, and, and rights and so on. All is this into question, you know, about school, about education, the content of education, uh, who, uh, you know, the uh, wearing of the niqab, and all of those things we are divisive, you know, and these are taking too much to my mind, too much weight in the society today, while we are still fragile in this transition while we should have been emphasizing more what brings people together rather than what divides people. And that's where we have the tensions today. Mr. Dabdub, allow me, I have a follow-up question to, to Dr. Hormat before we go on to the business the uh, segment. <laughs> because we will continue with the issue of uh, the parties who won the government and how does that affect business. But Dr. Uh, Dr. Nabli mentioned something that is very important. Does election, free election, mean democracy? The United States has always been an advocate of democracy. Is this the form of democracy? that you were advocating. We did free elections and we saw who won the, those elections and now there's a rewriting of the Constitution. Is full democracy achieved by that? Well, certainly free elections are a very important part of that. Uh, but I agree it's not the only part of that. And I think that the, the nature of the constitutional process and the uh, results of that process will be very important. I mean, protecting uh, the liberties of people, protecting freedom of speech, uh, giving opportunities for women, opportunities for minorities, the parties that are participating in the political process agreeing to give up violence as a means of exerting political pressure. All these things are, I think, important parts of a thriving democracy. Uh, but if we were to look at what's happening today, basically uh, in Egypt, for example, you have uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood Party won uh, a big part of the elections and then there are the Salafists. So basically, if there is any rewriting of the constitution today, it is being rewritten by a parliament that was won over by a majority of Islamic parties. So is that the way constitutions should be written? How do you then protect the rights of the minorities, of women? Of I think the one thing we should definitely not do is prejudge the outcome of that process. The, the people of Egypt have spoken through the ballot box. Uh, I myself, when I was in Cairo, had a chance to meet with the economic team of the FJP, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood Party. And we had a very pragmatic, practical conversation. It was about economic issues. But I don't think that we should automatically assume that the constitutional process is going to come out one way or another. I think we have to let these parties or the constitutional convention that the parliament will elect uh, decide what the constitution is and not prejudge it. That's, I think, critical. We should not prejudge what they're going to do. And my conversation with the, with the FJP uh, economic team was a very pragmatic one. So we'll see what they do, but we in America should not prejudge that process. Uh, Mr. D Dr. Nabli, very quickly. Follow up on this one, just, yes. just one word. I think it's clear, I mean, everybody knows, I mean, democracy, constitutions cannot and should not be written by the majority, any majority. A constitution is about a consensus, a national consensus, which should include everybody, not only the majority, those who have a majority in a given, at a given point in time, because it's written for decades, for centuries to go, and it's not the majority of today which should decide about the constitution of... One century and I think from one now. One critical element is the protection of minority rights. It's not, it's not that the majority should yeah. work with the minorities both to promote the Constitution, to write it, and protect the rights of minorities under the Constitution. That's a very important part of democracy. Uh, Tunisia also is, writing, uh, is in the process of writing a new constitution. But Mr. Dabdoub, you have a presence in Egypt through a subsidiary of yours uh, that is operating in Egypt. And this debate is going on there. You, as a businessman, are you comfortable at the way things are going? And what, what is it that worries you from a business perspective and from a political perspective as well? Well, the way I look at it from a, from a bigger picture basically is, as they say in the United States, the whole reason is uh, the, it's the economy stupid. Basically, Abu Aziz, he killed himself simply because he was unemployed. And I think to us in the Arab world, it's a question of the economy. It's a question of jobs. The Arab world has to create a lot of jobs they, uh, in order to be able to... Uh, uh, give really these, these young boys enough opportunities to be able to, to live uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a good life. This is my opinion as far as, as the reason behind all this. Now, as far as Egypt is concerned, uh, we are 
may be a little bit optimistic for in the long run, but in the, in the short term, we're not. Do you think honest. that a businessman would commit money investments in Egypt today? Well, let me the, tell you one thing. Are. First of all, I think the, 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 the uh, aggregate demand is down, consumption is down, and FDIs are down. We think that Egypt, basically, and I, I don't want to be too negative because maybe there are Egyptians here, now and we I, will be I don't want to, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, become enemies with some of my friends, but basically, <laughs> we're not terribly opti optimistic in the short term. In the long term, Egypt is still an 80 million people, and, and they have the, the resources and they have the capability if they are well managed. So in the long run, yes, we are optimistic. This is a movement that has started, not only in Egypt, but of course Egypt being the, 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 the largest country in the Arab world, it's the most important. But it will, it will never stop. This is a, a, a globalized world, yes. really. And the street has taken over, no matter what. The transition maybe from autocracy to democracy will take some time. It might take some time, but at the end, it will happen. So maybe we'll have to be a little bit more patient. But in the long run, yes, I'm optimistic. Uh, Mr. Dabdu, we're going to uh, continue this discussion, but we have to stop on a short break. Uh, and when we resume, we'll be opening the floor to questions. Mushahidi al Arabiya, waqfa ma fasil wa nutaba hadi hindu al hiwariya, ibko mana. This is just a very short break, few seconds. <laughs> Please stay put. <laughs> Three. مشاهدي العربية نعود معكم في هذه الندوة الحوارية والتي نتابع فيها النقاش حول تداعيات الربيع العربي وكما ذكرنا الندوة هي باللغة الإنجليزية اللغة الرسمية للمنتدى الاقتصادي العالمي. Uh, we started talking about the business uh, level and this is why I would like to address my question to Mr. Ali Babajan. Uh, basically this is on both the, politi the political level as well. I mean everyone is looking at the Turkish model as a successful model in the region. Um, However, the Turkish model is based on a secular state, and we saw Mr. Erdogan go to Egypt and advocate at the beginning of the uh, Arab Spring that um, the model doesn't work without a secular state, and there was some contro controversy uh, around that. Would it be successful if it weren't the Turkish model, if it weren't based on that secular state? Uh, this transition, as I said, is going to be extremely important for many countries, and every country will have its unique process. The process in every country is going to be quite different from each other, depending on the country-specific circumstances. But no matter what, I think there are some basic ideas, basic uh, principles here, which has to be taken into consideration. The first one is when we talk about a democratic system, it actually means the wills and the aspirations of the people reflected into the way how that country is run. And that's probably one of the definitions which we can make. Another important aspect is rule of law, making sure that the judicial system works. The rules are written and whatever is written is implemented. That's, I think, another important aspect to have a functioning uh, state mechanism. Uh, fundamental rights, freedoms, these are also very important issues. The state should be at equal distance to different ethnicities, to different religions and religious sects. Although we may call the region as the Arab world or the Arab region, there are many different fractions, many different uh, groups of people, different minorities in different countries, different religions and religious sects also. Uh, so for, for every group, it is very important for them to be able to live with the lifestyle they choose to do so, and it is very important for them to practice the religion or religious sect that they have faith in. And the state should be at a guaranteeing, at a guarantor position for those liberties to be fully enjoyed by the citizens of the country. When we talk about secularism, this word is a little bit uh, uh, dangerous because every country or every group has a different understanding of what we mean by a secular system. Actually, at the essence of secularism as we understand, and we are trying to better and better implement in Turkey, it is also about religious freedoms. I think it is no secret that in many countries in North Africa and Middle East, there were also oppression on the religious practices of people. People were suppressed and their religious freedoms were one way or another blocked. They were not able to 
express themselves. They were not able to also uh, do their social gathering or association and so forth. So I think it's very important to have that liberty. Freedom of expression also, and freedom of... Uh, exactly, exactly. That's also an es essential element that we probably should look for in these transition processes. A healthy constitution for every country is going to be, of course, uh, very important, being very clear of the setup. Consensus, well, of course it is desired. If it is possible, it is great. But on the other hand, uh, I think it is going to be important for the international organizations and also uh, the, the region as a whole to support each other in these processes. And you said Turkey is more and more taken, is, is being taken as a model. We, we don't have such an aspiration. I mean, it is not our intention and so forth. But what is you happening? You have bigger aspirations, yeah, Mr. Robert. What, what is happening? What Everybody is who's living in the Middle East knows that Turkey is assuming a bigger and bigger role, and it reminds us but a little bit of the Ottoman Empire. That's again, no, that. that <laughs> <laughs> I think that is somewhat of a of a wrong uh, perception because what uh, uh, we emphasize over and over again that it is very very important to conserve, to preserve the. Uh, territorial integrity of the countries, also independence of the countries, it's political unity of the countries. We are emphasizing these concepts a lot all throughout the region. Why is Turkey becoming more influential? I think what we are doing in Turkey is becoming a natural source of inspiration for other countries because mm. many, many young people in many countries in the region observe that now in Turkey, Islam and democracy can coexist and function in a better and better way. And when this is associated with an economic reform process, a, an economic reform process which is based on competition, which is based on uh, free market concepts, and an economic model which has also social concerns, a, a strong social yes. leg, then this whole composition becomes quite interesting for uh, many countries. And rather than advice or prescription, or rather than preaching, teaching, I think a functioning example becomes quite effective in yes. many countries. Let's hear from uh, Mr. Uh, Mohamed Boulif because, uh, as I mentioned, you, you were on the opposition. Now you are leading the government. The expectations are very high. What is your vision for the government? I mean, we, are, we were talking here about the secular state. Uh, do you think that uh, Morocco should, uh, adopt, should remain a, a secular state? What is your agenda as an Islamist party that has taken over the government now? نعم أكيد أن الموضوع المتعلق بالعلمانية يمكن أن أربطه أيضا بسؤالكم السابق المتعلق بالتدبير السياسي والانتخابي والدستوري لما يصعد إلى الحكم أحزاب إسلامية نحن بالنسبة إلينا في المغرب تصورتنا واضحة عندما نقول حزب إسلامي وأقيس بحزب العدالة والتنمية في المغرب بمعنى بكل تجرد أقول أنه من أكبر الأحزاب الديمقراطية وبالتالي ليس هناك تعارض إنما هو تعارض في مخيلة البعض تعارض الإسلام أو الأحزاب الإسلامية مع الديمقراطية يمكن أن أقول لك سيدتي أن الحزب الذي اختار وزراءه حتى في كثير من الدول الغربية التي تدعي أنها ديمقراطية نحن في العدالة والتنمية في المغرب اخترنا داخل مجلس وطني مكون من أكثر من 300 فرد منتخب اخترنا كيف يمكن أن نختار وزراءنا فتم الاختيار عبر الاقتراع بالتصويت على من سيتولى الحقائب الوزارية ثم إنه أيضا في التأسيس لهذا المنطق قدمنا أناس وأسماء وكانت من بينهم امرأة واحدة الآن اللي هي في الحكومة وللأسف شديد هناك امرأة واحدة وهي من العدالة والتنمية بينما التكتل الذي نحن فيه في المغرب تكتل من أربعة أحزاب ومنها من يقول أنه تقدمي اشتراكي منذ سنوات وتقدمي العدالة والتنمية هي الحزب الوحيد وبالتالي هذا شيء الشيء الثاني هو الـ 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 ما تفضل به قبل الأستاذ ما يتعطى بالعلمانية العلمانية علمانيات إن كنت تتحدثين عن العلمانية الفرنسية فأنا أرفضها العلمانية التي لا تتيح للطالبة أن تدخل الجامعة بالحجاب أنا أرفضها بينما العلمانية الإنجليزية أو السويدية التي تتيح حتى للشرطية أن تلبس حجابها وأن تسوق أو أن ترابط في ميدانها أنا, أنا معها فإذا العلمانية علمانيات نحن في العدالة والتنمية في المغرب بالفعل هناك مؤسسات وهناك استمرارية للمؤسسات لا يمكن أبدا أن ندعي على أننا سنقوم بمراجعة كامل المؤسسات لنخضعها للفلسفة الإسلامية أو للخلفية الإسلامية هناك الآن مؤسسات للمجتمع المدني هي حريصة على أن تراقب عمل الحكومة 
هناك تعددية معتبرة في المغرب سنحرص على أن تبقى هذه التعددية الآن الدستور أعطى للمعارضة حقوقا كبيرة ومنها أن يأتي رئيس الحكومة شهريا إلى مجلس النواب إلى البرلمان ليقدم حصيلته ويتدارس معه في كل, س... في كل شهر حصيلته فإن هو أراد أن يغير بطريقة سلبية أكيد أن المعارضة ستكون هناك لمجابهته وللدفاع عن ما يمكن أن يسمى حقوقا نحن نقول على أنه الآن نحن يجب أن نتقدم إلى الأمام يبدو لي أنه الإيديولوجية في 2012 لم تعد هناك إيديولوجية تتحكم أولا لا في المسار السياسي ولا في المسار الاقتصادي الآن شباب يريد الشغل يريد مستوى عيش محترم سنتحدث عن الاجندات الاقتصاديه الايديولوجيات اتصور ان كنت اسلاميا او اشتراكيا او ليبراليا لن تكون ضد الشغل ولن تكون ضد حريه المراه في العمل ولن 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 وبالتالي نحن متفقون على ان الشعب الان العربي والاسلامي يطلب انجازات عمليه تحسن مستواه قليلون هم الذين يبحثون عن الهويه uh, وعن Bolif, الدين وعن I think that these I think that these confirmations are are uh, assuring to many uh, who are listening to you now but let's open the floor to questions please give me a sign if you have any intervention or a question can we pass on the microphone to the first row Mr Khalid Janahi Thank you uh, just listening to you Nadine you're pushing it with the Islamist aspect I think we just as Mr Bolif just said now we got to be thinking in the future how the transition is going to go forward I think it's very very important this issue about talking that it was only economic social issue Umur Ma'ishiyah, which created the problem. Yes, it did. But unfortunately for everybody, it brought another issue, which brought the dignity factor. Dignity, you cannot buy dignity. Certain countries are increasing salaries 100%, 150%. They will do the same thing in two years down the road, four years down the road, creating major economic problem for themselves because there is no productivity whilst they're creating substantial inflation on the other side without actually, eventually they would have to accept dignity comes first. I think that's the important factor that we have to agree on and literally go forward. One thing that Mr. Dabdoub actually said, and I have to bring it up because he said it in uh, the Dead Sea meeting uh, about creating jobs, and King Abdullah II mentioned that we need 85 million jobs in the next seven to eight years. Uh, one of the solutions that uh, Mr. Dabdoub brought to the table was the Marshall Plan. I would like actually for him to elaborate on the Marshall Plan that he okay. read, because this is going forward. However, on that, um, when we talk about Marshall Plan, we're not talking about supporting and giving money to other countries. We're talking about actually investing and creating business. And Thank jobs. you, Mr. Janahi. Mr. Dabdoub, can you elaborate on that? Shaul. Shaul de Kaul. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking about the, the Arab Marshall Plan. Basically, I came up with the idea of the Arab Marshall Plan. Here, the Arab world, you know, we have three Arab worlds. It's not just one Arab world, the Levant, North Africa, and the Gulf. And the Gulf, they have enough resources to be able to come up with some sort of a Marshall Plan, a combination of IMF and World Bank together. Let me give you... But Egypt is refusing let, the IMF let me without give you, the, uh, the Marshall Plan. Mahili, let me give you an example uh, uh, about Egypt. Egypt is losing uh, their reserves very quickly because Farouk al uqda my friend, is, is trying to defend the Egyptian pounds. And I, I am talking about Egypt because Egypt is the most important country in the Arab world. And if Egypt fails, May God help us, because the whole Arab world will crumble. So if, if they start, if they, if they lose all their, their foreign currency to a certain extent where the, where, where the dollar would be 20 Egyptian pounds, we will have a, a, a catastrophe in the Arab world. Why, would, why shouldn't the, 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 the GCC, at least, and we did it in Kuwait with, with Lebanon back in the 80s, we placed deposits with the central bank. Why can't the GCC to Because, start Mr. With? Dabdoub, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Arab aid has stopped because the negotiations with, uh, with the IMF were not moving forward. I'm not and now I think the that Arab they are linked aid. together. The, 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 the Arabs are independent. Forget the IMF because the IMF is very bureaucratic. It will take years. I'm talking about one decision to place deposits with the Central Bank of Egypt before they lose all their, their foreign reserves. That's, that's what I'm saying. A, a, a role of IMF with the World Bank. The World Bank, maybe uh, uh, we're talking about development, yes. But, but now it's, it's very urgent. And this is what I'm trying to say. If there are any Egyptians on the floor, please, I would like to hear uh, an opinion uh, from, uh, from that perspective. But it doesn't seem that they are with us in the room. Uh, Mr. Hamza al Khouli had a, a remark as well. You had a question. You raised your hand. Tadal. <laughs> yes. 
Hamza Al-Khouli from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I raise this question because it's very important. Uh, Turkey has played a big role in the last few years in the Islamic and Arab world. And I realized when the Syrian problem started, Turkey was very active. And then we see the role is minimized now. I don't understand why. <laughs> well, uh, the, the case of Syria is every country is also quite peculiar and quite unique. Uh, we have tried a lot uh, for many years actually to win Syria, to make Syria part of solutions, not part of problems in our region. We have helped them a lot with their economic reform process. Many, many reforms that they have done, actually, we worked together. But the political reforms, unfortunately, did not happen. And there is an, a, a very natural dilemma that the regime is now facing. Because on one hand, it's a minority regime trying to overrule a majority. But on the other hand, when we talk about Syria and ask from them, you you need to be more democratic, let's say, and more of a representative democracy is needed, more of a uh, parliamentary democracy is needed. Then the, the, the minority is, of course, asking to itself and others, okay, what's going to happen to me? What's, what am I going to do? And also with the case of Syria, unlike other countries, the international community does not have a united stance. But there Turkey's, Turkey's position has softened a big time because I remember uh, Mr. Erdogan in March was saying that, I can't find the quote now, but he's, he mentioned that military intervention will happen if uh, the killing uh, continues no, no, and goes no. on. No, no, so never, now never, never Turkey has, it looks no. like it has softened its position. No, we don't believe in military interventions. No, that's, that's not the exact words that my prime minister have ever used about the case of Syria. He we always said that Hamas, we, are against, we are against external uh, external uh, intervention to any country. The best is to have the change by the domestic momentum, domestic dynamics. For the case of Syria, we have been vocal f for quite some time. We are still so. But then the Arab League started to take more ownership of the process. And when Arab League, for the first time, probably, had the meetings among themselves, had a united stance, a list of sanctions, and an observer group to be yes. sent to the country, we thought it would be best to find an Arab-made solution so the Arab world would find You're a way out themselves. You're giving a chance now for the Arab League. Exactly, because we didn't uh, want this to be in a situation where, as you have said, you know, the Ottoman Empire times, because that, it's very easily mis misunderstood, misperceived. Yes. So that's, that's why we wanted to be first the Arab League to move, and then we followed, for example, for the sanctions, when there was we a meeting to, in Egypt. Yes. I'm sorry, we have to there. take a short break and continue the discussion, Mr. Babajan. Okay. Uh, it seems we have, some, we have an Egyptian on the floor and we are going to hear from him. Mustafa Abdul Wadud, why not? Okay. <laughs> Yalla, we're going back uh, from the break. مشاهدينا اهلا وسهلا بكم من جديد نتابع الندوه الحواريه من دافوس وكنا نناقش الموضوع المصري ويبدو انه معنا في الحضور هنا صوت مصري اللي نسمع منه اذا we were uh, talking about Egypt and we asked if there was there was an Egyptian opinion someone from Egypt in the floor and it seems Mustafa Abdul Wadud is with us he just arrived where is he we have Mr. Amir Musa as well so let's start with Mustafa because he has a microphone uh, Mustafa do you have any comment on the discussion that was happening before I think, I mean, I've heard a lot of the comments and uh, it's interesting to see the different kind of views on Egypt and I'll address Egypt uh, specifically. And I think uh, one, one as an Egyptian, but I, I think there's a different perspective as a private equity investor across emerging markets, Egypt being one of them. And we have historically been investors in Egypt and I'll, you know, summarize by saying we'll continue to be investors in Egypt. And I think we don't hold the very pessimistic view that my friend Brahim Dabdu holds. That does not mean that there are not challenges. I think the economy is going through a series of challenges. Uh, to be fair, Egypt witnessed a very solid period of economic uh, growth in the previous regime. You have to give it that. However, it was perhaps uh, a bit too aggressive at the expense of po uh, political and social reform, and something had to crack, and it indeed it did. I think what you will have going forward is a period of lower economic growth. Egypt will need to find its way. I think there's varying degrees of economic illiteracy, perhaps, in the current decision-making, because it's not a priority. Uh, it takes a backseat to the political process. 
but it will be quickly become a force priority because of the realities on the ground. And I think there is essentially a self-correcting mechanism because Egypt is not a rich country by definition, and hence the only way forward is to look at promoting uh, economic growth through private investment, both local and international. So uh, I think that reality is set in. I think the discussions with IMF will resume. I think the Arab world will recognize the role as highlighted on the, on the platform here. Thank you, here. Mustafa. And, yeah. and I think we'll move forward. Thank uh, you. Mustafa, let's hear from Mr. Amr Musa. I will address the question to him because he just came in. Uh, Mr. Musa, we were discussing basically the issue of Egypt, and we said that there is a little bit of fear that now free elections were held, but free elections do not necessarily mean democracy. And now there is a rewriting of the constitution. So how can uh, Egypt send a message that uh, it will protect the minority, the interests of the minorities, uh, it will protect the rights of women, uh, because we know the nature of the, uh, the parties that won. Quick reply, please. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first express uh, a, uh, some difference of views uh, with Mustafa Abdul Wadud. Egypt is not that poor country but Egypt was badly run. Had we got our act together, we would have achieved a lot in terms of economy and the, uh, all the files of our society. That is number one. But the rest of what he said was absolutely, I, I do support what he uh, has said. Now, the question is that Egypt is in transitional period. We are moving from full dictatorship to full democracy. We have suffered from the way Egypt was run under the, in the previous regime in the last decades, six decades, three of them under one, the rule of one man. The indicators are so bad. I was in another uh, Mr. panel Mr. now. I will give you the chance tomorrow morning to elaborate. You are a speaker on a, so on a full panel, but today? very quickly. <laughs> I need a very quick answer from you. Yeah. Uh, so on, the, on the topic of the constitution. Yeah. The constitution yes, the will of... certainly be a constitution of the 21st century. All those rights will have to be enshrined. Certainly, I agree with you. The rights of all citizens, I do not call them minor minority. Equal it's rights. It's not a question of Muslims, Christians, but yes. all citizens will have to be treated equally. And this should be enshrined in the constitution and protected by law. This will take place. As for the it has to take place. It cannot be but that. Yes. The, as for women and the rights of women, etc., of course, this is a new Egypt. And things that perhaps would not be achieved in a month or two will be achieved in a year or two. Mr. Amr, I'll have the opportunity to challenge that statement tomorrow morning in the panel that we have together. But let's move on now to the economic aspect before our time is over. Uh, of course, we want to talk a little bit about the Deauville partnership and also the NAPEO, which is uh, the North Africa Partnership for Economic Opportunity. Uh, Dr. Nabli. Uh, we know that Tunisia and Morocco here are facing problems today because of their reliance and exposure to the EU. Uh, so regardless of the political issues, there is an economic problem. Add to that the need for creation of jobs, for inclusive growth. So where, where is Tunisia from all that today? And where is, what is the situation of the aid that was promised to you? Um, first, I think uh, one year after the revolution, what, what turns out to be the case is that the cost of the transition, the economic cost, is much, much larger than what we anticipated. We did not anticipate growth to be negative to the level it was in 2011 uh, in Tunisia and I think the same in other countries. So the economic cost was much larger than what expected. So that's, that's one. Second, the global environment has not been supported. Last year when I was here in Davos, I said to the advanced countries, please do no harm. Actually, they have been doing a lot of harm. I mean, the Eurozone crisis and the global economic crisis and so on has not been helping us, has been, you know, uh, a negative factor for us. Uh, growth is negative, uh, exports are suffering, tourism is suffering, and all of that, capital markets are a problem and so on. So the global economy is not supporting us, uh, in addition to the, our domestic problems, of course, of course. Now, third, on the Deauville partnership and the global support. We have heard a lot of things in the Global uh, Deauville Partnership, big numbers. Unfortunately, this has not been accompanied by any reality in the, on the ground. Hard cash hasn't, that hasn't you know, been delivered. Big words, very small acts, uh, I have to say. And uh, I have had a chance to say it to our partners all along, uh, whether it's the U.S. and the Secretary is here, I mean, and, and, and I say it to our European friends and Gulf friends and, and everybody. Uh, actually, there has been very little financial support forthcoming. 
Let's uh, ask Dr. Not, not talking about yeah. the deposits, which is the easiest one, uh, but I'm any others. About, about the development. only, I have to say, just for, for transparency, the only financial uh, support that we got in 2011 is support from the World Bank, from the African Development Bank, and a little bit from the European Union, and some from the French Development Organization, very small. So, and the numbers are very, very far from what has been discussed. What has and been very, not very different Let's hear from, from Dr. Hummets because he is very much involved in that. Uh, doctor, uh, I have two questions here. First of all, the Deauville partnership. Is it conditional? Is aid conditional on uh, some political, uh, I mean, milestones? Or is, are there any conditions? And number two, what about the NAPEO? Is it just technical assistance or will there be money delivered? Well, let me, let me just make one broad point and then go to the details. The, the broad point is that it's been our view from the beginning that economic reform and political reform are really part of the same process. If economic reform uh, moves ahead and countries have a higher level of prosperity and job creation, it will make the political reform process easier and vice versa. The smoother the political process, the more confidence it gives investors domestic investors and foreign investors. So part of the Deauville partnership is to encourage uh, the kinds of political reforms that are in many cases underway already. And we're not and cannot impose these reforms on these countries, but we can identify some of the reforms that we think we can provide support for, technical support for, or, or otherwise. On the economic side, uh, Ibrahim Daboud made a very interesting point earlier about uh, the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was only partly about money. It was largely, and the genius of it was, that it was about collaboration among the countries, in that case, the country of, countries of Western Europe, in their own recovery. So from an American point of view, and indeed from the point of view of all the countries of the Doval Partnership, which include Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Russia, and Japan, the goal is to try to work with one another to come up with a wide range of efforts to be supportive. One of the ways is to improve opportunities for trade between the region and the rest of the world. Another is to encourage opportunities for trade within the region, which can be very helpful. There's very little trade except for oil and gas within, within, the, Arab within the Arab world. It would unlock enormous opportunities, as in the case of Southeast Asia, where there's a lot more trade among one another. The other is to identify ways in which companies can develop supply chain relationships with the region. And a lot of companies from the US and Europe and other countries, particularly Turkey, where the prime minister has actually led delegations of companies to, to go out to the region. The other area that I think is particularly important is small and medium-sized enterprises. This, it seems to me, if you look at what's happened in many of these countries, the big companies did quite well because they were connected to the rest of the world and many of them were connected to the powerful But there wasn't family. enough assistance for the SMEs. But there, but there wasn't enough assistance for the SMEs and there wasn't, more importantly, the question of rule of law. They didn't have the opportunity, the regulatory benefits, they didn't have access to capital. So what is needed is internally for these countries to support small and medium-sized enterprises but also through outside support to help them because first of all, it creates a greater degree of democratization in their economies. And second, they're big job creators. And I think those are the elements that are very important in prosperity in the future. Unfortunately, our time is uh, over. Uh, this is a televised panel, and we have a constraint on time. Thank you very much for all, for all of our panelists, and thank you very much for the audience for being here with us.